Anyways, this is for the design and performance of unbonded concrete overlays. It was a synthesis project, so it's, <clears throat> excuse me, short term. It's intended to be short term collection of data and then kind of uh, put that together in a, a summary format. Uh, um, oh, I want to switch. We'll go to the next slide. Let's see if I can. Just have to do it. Uh -huh. well, maybe is it take time to load when you switch slides? Oh, there it goes. I'm, I'm not sure. There we go. Yep. There it goes. Uh, so it's a the objective is to produce a, a brief technical document synthesizing design design uh, differences uh, construction. Uh, if there's any, and maintenance practices. And then if we can, provide some performance information as well on overlays. And it's kind of primarily focused on the NRA states that are participating in this. So the, so, so the goal is what are kind of the various state practices for design and construction, and what are the results? So what is not included in this report, a concrete overlay is typically identified as bonded. Um, uh, ultra thin type white topping or anything like that is not in here. What we're really focused on is a new concrete overlay with an inner layer. And that inner layer, as you can see here, is either can be HMA, hot mix asphalt, or uh, more frequently, um, more uh, <clears throat> usual now, or I should say, uh, uh, Geotextile fabric is becoming more, more and more used or tried in, in a few of the states over an existing concrete pavement that's cracked up or providing some performance issues, uh, needing maintenance beyond beyond the reasonable cost. So, uh, for the, so we, we limit to the unbounded concrete consists of New Portland cement. We kind of covered this, uh, and it can be successfully constructed over distressed concrete pavements with minimal prep work. So I think that's the other piece of it is uh, the intent or part of it is of an unbonded overlay. And I think when we looked at some of the states, I think to varying degrees, prep work is performed. But uh, the hope is that uh, with an unbonded overlay is that we're doing limited prep work. Um, it's, it's really kind of using that base layer, that old concrete as the base. Um, so uh, the bond breaker, inner layer bond breaker is, is relatively important. Um, the term unbonded, I'm going to step to the second paragraph there first, really identifies that the bonding is not needed versus whether it's actually bonded or not. Often I think uh, if you're using a hot mix asphalt, that asphalt is, or a, gra or a milled asphalt surface that has the old asphalt is bonded to the existing pavement surface. And then it's more than likely that the new concrete will bond to that uh, asphalt surface, particularly being milled, it's kind of a rough surface. But the idea being is you're designing it, assuming that uh, you don't need that bond to provide some structural um, uh, structural uh, structure to the, to the new concrete. Um, so keep in mind, and then that inner layer that's used has historically been either a new hot mix asphalt or a milled hot mix asphalt surface. And more recently, and it's been a few years now, it's not, not recent, I mean, it's been around for a while, geotextiles fabric has been used to, uh, to create that uh, bond breaker. Um, I think there's, there's uh, looking at which one is maybe appropriate. Uh, for, for how badly distressed your concrete might be. Uh, looking at curling and warping, is geotextile fabric really address that? Uh, so I think there's still some questions out there that are being researched. Uh, so these are the states that I kind of participated and then we have a uh, table here where we kind of went through a quick table that you can kind of look at uh, to provide some information as far as what each state is doing. Um, I do have a slide here. So uh, one thing to keep in mind as we go through the report here, the states, state practices are not uniform through the states that participated. And the report that we have now, this report was generally drafted last year. 
uh, and the information was synthesized from published online state specifications. Uh, so that's that's what we drew our information from. Uh, we did make some effort to look at amended specifications uh, that are published uh, and our special provisions that are used. Uh, I think different states use different approaches for that. Uh, so the unpublished variations to specifications, updates, uh, research that you're actually implementing on a, on a broader scale um, is, is may not be included in here. Um, so what we are looking for though is if, if you are in a state, go ahead and take a look at this draft report particularly and if, and if there's any items you feel that are not accurate or up to date, please let us know. We'll quickly update that as much as possible. But we do kind of want to finalize it and it will have a, uh, by next year, some of the specs will change as well, I'm sure. So uh, design practice, thickness design. Uh, generally speaking, the overlay is designed to pro perform with a performance period of 20 or 20 to 40 years, somewhere in that range. A lot of states have a minimum thickness uh, they use as a standard. Uh, a lot of them are looking at thinner overlays, doing different things, but uh, joint spacing, whether or not you have fibers in the concrete, things like that. Um, but but in general, for the unbonded concrete, it appears that most states had like a minimum in that. Uh, we'll cover that a little later too. Um, and then with a, that minimum thickness would provide a standard joint layout as well. And then a lot of the states are in general are using reinforcements. So they're using tie bars between lanes and they're using dowels, particularly in the uh, seven inches and greater thickness. So pre-treatments, there's not a lot of definition there, but certainly uh, grinding has been used to kind of help manage quantities. Um, if you have a lot of faulting, crack panels, things like that, you may use a thicker um, layer as well. So we kind of thicker inner layer of, the, of HMA as opposed to a fabric. So there's a couple different approaches to that, all the way up to a crack and seat or something like that you could do. Inner layers uh, predominantly have been uh, milled HMA surfaces or an HMA surface, uh, a geotextile fabric, and I know one state uh, they tack geotextile fabric or use some sort of uh, fasteners. Um, uh, again, you can put a dense graded or open graded new HMA surface on there if it's existing concrete. Uh, and a, in a lot, we'll cover a little bit later, is drainage is, is kind of appears to be important in terms of the integrity or the long-term performance of that inner layer. And then also uh, some states, depending on thickness, are looking at different construction joint spacings. You, know, you have a pretty solid platform with that old concrete down there. So. Uh, General construction pretreatments, so before placing the inner layer, uh, milling of old HMA uh, hot mix, you're looking at uh, cross slope smoothness, um, and you want to leave that in place. Maybe some surface cleaning. If there's some severe distresses, punch outs, fail patches, uh, you may go in and address those. If you see areas of pumping water, you may go and address those through drainage and. Uh, Along, uh, along the pavement edge. And then uh, and then some states kind of appeared like they appear crack, uh, repair cracks and spalls, uh, but to what extent, I'm not sure uh, I can really provide good information on that in terms of how we got things. Uh, jointing and reinforcement, uh, most are using reinforcement, tie bars and doll bars. Soft cut patterns are generally, you know, are really defined by that overlay thickness and they're pretty standard. So, between 12 and 15 feet seems to be a general standard. And again, we're using thicknesses of seven inches and a greater on a lot of these. So they have those minimum thicknesses. And then in some states are using some fibers and, and other things. Some additional items, uh, California, they include a geotextile layer below the HMA inner layer uh, in some of their projects to help control reflective cracking. I think that's kind of interesting to look look at. And then in Minnesota, the, in their specification that it's desirable to locate the transverse joints at least three feet from an existing transfer joint or working crack. Uh, so that's something that has to be managed a little bit in the field. You're going to probably have a maximum joint spacing and adjust that as you move along. 
some of the constraints uh, that we that we have in planning. Uh, the thicker thicker inner layers uh, may be required to address highly deteriorated or faulted pavements. That goes into cost. Uh, thicker overlay might add costs. Uh, uh, you're gonna you have a lot of roadside stuff. I mean, guardrail and Jersey barrier and things like that are designed and in, in they have to be in a certain uh, location uh, vertically. Uh, you might have to work with side slopes. Uh, Roadway connections. Is this an urban section with curb and gutter? A lot of things to consider in terms of really balancing the cost at bridges. If you have a lot of bridges in an urban area, you might be uh, looking at vertical clearance issues where you have to actually dig down and put in a new full depth pavement and transition. Uh, and how many times do you do that? Um, and then the existing pavement, any areas that are susceptible to heaves or settlements, you probably want to fix those before you do your overlay as well. Alignment changes certainly is uh, well. And with regards to performance, all states are general are reporting generally pretty good performance from what we could tell. Maintenance has been minimal on a lot of these. We haven't had any other than uh, failures, and we'll get into that on the next one. But they typically follow their concrete pavement rehab specifications for those pavements. So it isn't something new. Um, where uh, a couple of states reported poor performing uh, overlays, and, and in, in uh, two or three of those cases, or all of them, they had an HMA inner layer that appears to have been stripped of the asphalt. So again, that leads to uh, looking at your asphalt layer that goes in there if you use it, and what your drainage is alongside underneath that concrete pavement as well. I think those are important things. And then uh, we mentioned the vertical clearance of bridges. I'm sure why it's in there. One thing to keep in mind, I think there's a new pool fund study that's going to be complete here very shortly, and Tom can kind of comment on that to add. But the purpose of that study is to create a national unified design guide for unbonded overlays and exist, uh and uh, I'm sure that's probably going to, and like I said, Tom, it would be better to comment on this maybe at the end here. Uh, but uh, looking at some of the different, uh, probably like getting into thin overlays as well. The objectives of that study are to understand the field performance of unbonded overlays as demonstrated by test sections. To, you know, really identify a suitable separator layer because there's a few different things, whether a thin piece of geotextile or a, a thicker asphalt, and where those are more applicable than not. I think that's really important too. And then develop a design procedure uh, for thickness based on performance, uh, and then uh, to kind of fill in with deficient or missing design parameters and existing methods. Uh, that's the I put the uh, study kind of website or contact right there. I don't know, Tom, if you have an additional comment on that? Uh, yes, the, the, the project is done. We're right in the process of uh, publishing the final report. And uh, uh, Lev, of course, is on the line, so he could address any questions um, when you're done with your presentation on that. OK. So that's kind of the uh, big items. I think what would be helpful for us let me see if I can get to the report here real quick and just kind of, okay. So this is more or less the Word document on the report where it's at. Kind of most recently, uh, we have a table of contents. I'm going to go through rather quickly, but of course, this is going to be available. You can get a copy of it. Uh, kind of gives an idea of the background. What we're looking at, I mean, we're not looking at ultra thin, we're not looking at white topping, things like that. Uh, we're not looking at those designs. What is FHWA kind of guidance and uh, short, uh, why, and then some of the design practices I think we get into here. Um, but further as we get here, we have our summary table, which I think is probably really a quick, helpful guide. But then we go through state by state that we did review and kind of provided a little bit of summary in, in the same, so uh, their performance and maintenance on their pretreatments, uh, anything that they had kind of published that we could uh, include in here, um, their design procedures. And again, if they're doing, if, if the states are doing something experimental, it's probably not in here. 
if it's something in the last year to two years, it may not be included here. A lot of our stuff was focused on the published specifications and our special provisions. So we tried to capture what was the, what we would consider maybe the standard for that state. And again, you know, if there was some change and they whole, wholesale changed a lot of things and, and put an amendment in their contract, we would probably not have that. Uh, information on interlayer. Um, and then uh, again, and then go through the various states. Uh, so that's kind of, we want to get a little bit of more information here. Uh, we were not able to find anything. And just, uh, I think, coming to the end, there's some reference information. Uh, I think I think Wisconsin doesn't really do unbonded overlays. So we did not find anything there. And then we kind of had a couple things uh, for research to consider. Again, there's this big study coming out here that may actually uh, cover a whole bunch of stuff, but a whole bunch of new items and things going on. Uh, but I think a lot of the fabric, the inner layer and the joint spacing and the use of fibers are going to be kind of big items moving forward. And then how distressed is, can your underlying concrete be before you have to do some pretreatments? Those are kind of the, to me, the bigger items in the overlay design. Uh, and most have minimum thicknesses. So um, in short, I think I know I ran through that pretty quickly. Um, uh, here's, the, here's what we kind of use to put our stuff together. And then I don't know if anybody has any questions. Anybody got any questions for Joe? So again, for the various states who are online here or are interested in this, certainly keep an eye out for this new study that's going to be published soon. But also take a look at this, and if you see something glaringly like we made an error, you know, please let us know. Uh, but we would like to finalize the report. I have one question for Joe. This is Pete Kemp, Wisconsin. Yep. Uh, Pete, I think we lost you. Can somewhat hear you? He can. You, is there a chat function? Yeah, Peter, can you type in your question? Because we're having trouble hearing your audio. It's breaking up. I wonder if he's using like a headset. Hmm. Ah, there it is. Yeah, you know, what do you think is the main benefit? Must be on an LLCA basis. Okay. Uh, life cycle question. cost basis? Mm hmm So I uh, say that again. What is the major? The main benefit on a LC okay. It says he's on a headset. Okay. Yeah, what, what, what do you think is the main benefit on an L LCA basis? That's his question. L oh, I think, I think, uh, LCCA, okay, LCCA. Life cycle cost analysis. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think some states, I know Minnesota for sure, you have to, uh, life cycle cost analysis has to be done, but sometimes that's limited. So I think the life cycle cost analysis has to be global. So what, what, I, what I mentioned, if you have to put it in, in an urban section, you're looking at new curb and gutter, you're looking at new, um, new Jersey barrier, potentially you're looking at you know, on a high-speed roadway, ramps and loops connections. So you're looking at, you know, some side impacts um, and bridge potentially bridge clearances. So you're looking at some side impacts that really should be included in your cost estimate and I, to various degrees. I think if you're in a, a rural area, it's so much easier to, you know, just uh, let's, you know, do uh, the. So I think the analysis is going to be different based on where you're at, and I think it's really important. And it's for me, the whole cost is picking up what that entire cost is. Um, you know, some of the options might be remove and repave with concrete versus versus an unbonded. Um, you might have a thicker pavement, but all those side side costs maybe you uh, defray or you don't have. Does that 
more or less, is that what he was kind of thinking about or what? He says, why would we not just remove and replace the pavement? And I think that's a viable option. I think you have to do a comparison for that. I think in a, in a certainly in a, uh, where you have a lot of side, side costs because of the fact that you're raising the elevation of the roadway, absolutely. Uh, but I, th I think it's very cost effective. I think you can have thinner, you know, you're, you maybe have an inch or two you can shave off because you have such a stable base. Uh, I, I just think, you know, it, you have to look at each job individually. The other thing is you have, it's a lot faster. I think it's, I think it's pretty quick. And again, in an urban area versus a rural area, you have different considerations and you should look at each project individually. In my opinion, I think he has concerns about mitigating reflective cracking. And I can speak on that, that, you know, when Lev was doing his study, that it's very rarely found that we get reflective cracking if you have a good inner layer. So yeah, the, again, I think that, you know, it, that leads to the amount of structure you have in the new concrete, how thick it is, versus the um, bonding, how much bonding do you actually have? And, uh, and uh, you know, again, a couple of states are using some different different approaches, too. I know Minnesota uses that, attempts to get to that three-foot rule, tries to keep away from joints. Um, but, again, I think there's more information. But um, does that help? I hope that answers the question. Looks good. Thank you. Yeah, this is Brett. I would only add that when we do a unbonded overlay, the uh, the uh, asphalt option would be rebelization, so they compete head to head, and it is the speed the speed factor of having to remove it all and replace it. So it's it's definitely faster and it's uh, more we find it more effective. As for some of the structures like bridges, if you don't have quite the clearance, then then there would be some removal at those locations to maintain the, the, the clearance under the, uh, the bridges, overpasses. And I would, I would say some of our old concrete pavements and maybe some of our newer ones aren't built on the best subgrades. That's why we're built. So once you dig into that subgrade, you have some other uh, construction constraints you're gonna run into as well with remove and replace potentially. Yeah. I, this, is Leo, this is Leo from California. Um, with our experiences out in the desert, where you normally have a, just a four-lane interstate, um, we like to do the concrete overlays because when they compete against the HMA alternative of, say, crack seed and overlay, which you could build under traffic, um, you do a life cycle cost analysis, and the HMA alternative is going to win. But we, you know, you have a concrete road, and you have um the harsh uh you know weather and elements out there out in the desert you would rather go with a with a concrete pavement so we opted to do uh, concrete overlays um with that respect with crcp uh, another thing too i i have a a project it's an nce is is doing some studies on our concrete uh, overlays and there's one that we have that was sort of by accident where they came in and put uh, a brand new CRCP overlay right on top of an old jointed planning concrete with no inner layer, no uh, you know HMA inner layer or geotextile. So we're looking at that and seeing how that performs. I mean, it's right, right smack right on top of the old concrete. So I thought I'd share that with you because we're looking into it and see you know, how well that's going to hold up. We may fi find out we don't need inner layer. I don't know. That's interesting. We have to keep our eyes open. You have to keep us posted on that one. Uh, <laughs> well, I appreciate Joe for that. I wish we had more time to, to have a conversation, but we got two other presentations to go. Uh, I think John scurried down the hallway. He thinks he's ready to go. So, yeah, I'm here, Brett. Um, all right. <clears throat> okay. All right, John. Ready to go now. Okay, uh, my presentation's on a uh, compacted concrete pavement. Uh, 
Well, we, we did a, a mile and a half section of uh, two lane outer road. And then we also combined that we also did a couple, uh, three test sections within those, those job limits. Um, <clears throat> this is located in the boot heel of Missouri uh, off of I-55 and uh, the, uh, the construction originally we were going to do six inches but because we had issues with the subgrade we needed to stabilize it so we uh, worked out an arrangement with the contractor to uh, actually thin up the uh, uh, the compacted concrete pavement to six inches and then uh, put it on our, our kind of our standard four inch crushed stone base and then uh, and then put that on uh, 12 inches of, of lime stabilized uh, subgrade. Uh, it was actually built back in October. The test sections were actually built back in October of 2018, but the entire project itself wasn't completed till uh, actually just a few weeks ago. Uh, they had some issues with the grading subcontractors, so they had, had delays for over a year. But anyway, it's complete, and it's like I said, it's about roughly a mile and a half long. And you can see from the screen there where the uh, uh, kind of where the test site sits. So this is in the in the uh, northeast quadrant of that of that interchange. Um, this is the mixed design. Uh, the, the main thing to know about this is it's an extremely extremely dry mix. When I saw the stuff in the hopper or the paver when I, I first came to the job site, I almost thought they had crushed stone in there. I was wondering why they were putting base material in the in a paver before I realized what it was. Um, the, uh, the There were three test sections and one of them had fibers and the fibers we used was the uh, tough strand product uh, and the dosage rate was five pounds per cubic yard. This is how they mixed it. They needed a twin shaft pug mill because again, this was a very dry mix, uh, required a lot of energy to, to thoroughly mix it. And uh, so they had a plant set up with the, uh, the pug mill near the job site. Uh, as far as the construction of it went after, well, they kind of did some, a little bit of trial and error, but in order to get a, uh, a steady stream of material, they decided they needed to have a belt placer out there. Um, so the trucks could back up into that and uh, we can keep a uniform head of material in the paver. The other thing they, they implemented after uh, again, a little trial and error, it was actually putting a surge hopper uh, in the uh, high density paver itself. So you can kind of see that thing sitting in the back, or in, I'm sorry, in the front of the paver there. And with the high density paver, we were measuring at roughly 95%, which is about par for what you'd expect. Um, a few things are a little surprising. Well, one, you could see what I'm talking about. You can kind of see how the the, the mix has kind of a fibrous look to it. If you look at the head of material in that lower picture, uh, again, very dry. And uh, I was kind of surprised that they wanted this high uh, head of material in front of it, but it seemed to provide a more um, more uniform, more, more uniform uh, uh, thickness once it got under the screed. Also, too, this was actually a stringless uh, paver as well. So we had the uh, the total stations. There are about two or three total stations set up around there uh, to communicate with the uh, with the paver. There were some issues with this paver on super elevated sections for whatever reason, and uh, so they had some some excessive supers that they they took a a, a skid steer to kind of knock down a little bit. And uh, I was surprised how easily you could keep reworking the material for a while. I, I kind of was worried about that a little bit when I first saw them doing that, but it seemed to, uh, uh, they seemed to be able to roll it and finish it fine after they, they had to rework the, the depth on, on some small sections of it. Now for final density, they just had like a little three ton vibratory roller, which seemed to do the trick. Uh, we're shooting for 98% and that's roughly what they were getting after one or two passes with this roller. 
And then uh, part of the compacted concrete formula is using a uh, finishing aid um, and uh, it's sprayed on and then they were using a power trowel to, to work it in and then doing a curing it, although I, I kind of, now that I'm looking at that picture, not exactly the best curing job, I, I don't think, but uh, hopefully they're applying a little more uniform coverage in other areas. Now these are the test sections that we set up. Uh, we had two 500 foot sections. The only difference between, and, and neither of these had fibers, the only difference between the two was the joint spacing. One was one had 15 foot joint spacing, the other 12. And then we did the short 250 foot section with the fibers. Uh, all of these were only in one lane. It was in the, uh, the southbound lane that was constructed first. The research was done through the um, Missouri Science and Technology University. Um, Dr. Kamal Kayet and his associates, uh, uh, Dr. Nima uh, uh, Farzadnia and uh, um, Ahmed Abdel Razik, were doing the research with their grad students and looked at a number of things. We're looking at the Kind of the consens consistency and density with the, using the beep test, um, doing cylinder breaks, cylinder and core breaks, doing uh, both cast in place uh, uh, flexural tests as well as 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 uh, sawed beams, um, checking permeability and resistivity, uh, looking at the uh, air void system of the hardened concrete, and also doing um, uh, freeze thaw testing in the uh, uh, in the chamber, and then lastly, also looking at shrinkage. They also did some. Um, there are also some some instrumentation set up to look at the uh, curling and warping, as well. And uh, there's instrumentation for for measuring the profile of the uh, temperature profiles of the of the slabs over time. And for the sampling matrix, basically they were doing about three samples per data point uh, for each test. Uh, there were some though that they only had two, two samples for whatever reason to average. And this is showing the, the instrumentation and uh, we were indebted to uh, uh, the Minnesota DOT sent some of their staff down to uh, install this. We had the vibrating wire strain gauges for kind of the, kind of measuring the longer term strain changes from environmental effects. And then also the uh, dynamic strain gauges for, for the, uh, the, the faster quick uh, strain changes from passing truck loads. Um, had a thermal couple trio with eight sensors to measure the, um, the uh, temperature profile, also a uh, joint opening block out to measure uh, uh, expansion and contraction of the joints. And then each of the three test sections had its own data logger cabinet. And this is showing the, uh, the plan schematic of the test sections. Uh, the strain gauges were installed tra both transversely, both kinds of strain gauges were installed transversely and, and longitudinally at different points in the, in the slab. Everything was pretty much in one panel uh, that was uh, hardwired to the uh, data logger cabinet. And it's just showing some pictures of the uh, of casting um, the uh, cylinders and, and beams in place that the students did with the university. And then later, um, I'm trying to remember, I think it was, I was out there, me and Brett were out there when this was done, about two months later, uh, actually took cores and then sawed the uh, sawed out those panels, which were, by the way, good exercise loading those into the truck. These are what the test sections look like currently. We stressed to the contractor that they should not diamond grind the uh, test sections. Um, they didn't diamond grind the actual instrumented slab, so that's good, but they they did grind everything up to within a panel on either side. So basically, out of the uh, uh, out of the test sections, we only have three, you know, 15 or 12 foot panels that uh, that were not ground. But 
anyway, they did stay off of the the one that was instrumented. So that was that was the most important one. A uh, little comment about the finish on these. They they did have some problems with. It's no surprise. I mean, with CCP or RCC, um, you know, the Achilles heel for it is always going to be the uh, smoothness or ride. But I was impressed. Uh, they're they're diamond grinding the entire thing, obviously, except the test sections. And I think even without the grinding, they were really being able to improve the ride quite a bit as, as they got into more production mode, got better at what they were doing. And when I was driving it uh, a few weeks ago, I mean, I was going about probably 45 miles an hour. And uh, for an outer road, I thought it was uh, an above average ride. So. Um, it's a pretty good job. Now, talking about the test results, running the VEB test, I think the most significant uh, fact here was the fact that the density of the uh, the fiber reinforced concrete was much higher than the uh, uh, than the fibers or the concrete without the fibers, 142 versus 124 pounds per cubic foot. So I think the university had theory about what caused that. I'm not sure I understood exactly what they what they meant. So I'm not gonna not gonna quote it. But uh, in any event, that's that's what we were seeing, and it was kind of reflected too in the results of the uh, cast in place versus uh, uh, sawed and cored uh, material. Um, for the compressive strength brakes, the uh, Cast and play samples were definitely greater than saw cut samples. No surprise there, I don't think. Um, but then also, too, the uh, strength of the mix with the fibers was greater than the mix without fibers, which I believe is related to the previous point about the, uh, the fact that the fiber reinforced concrete had a higher density. And so it makes sense that it was going to have a higher, higher compressive strength as well. Um, a few oddball results there, I guess. The uh, I think it was on the 91 day. Where was it? Oh yeah, if you look at the without the fibers, the uh, 91 day for the cast and play samples, the 91 day results, the average was 32.76, and for the 28 day, it was 36.67. So um, yeah, I'm not sure why that happened, but. Uh, I guess everything else was kind of in line, although the the difference between you know fiber reinforced versus non fiber reinforced I think was was pretty stark for the cast and play samples, and uh, and there still is definitely a difference between them for the cord samples, but less so uh, maybe because both achieved uh, lesser density than what they were able to do by uh, doing a pretty thorough mixing with the uh, with the beams and, and cylinders. For the flexural tests, kind of similar results. Uh, the uh, the the cast in or sorry the, uh, the cast in place again are higher across the board than the uh, the saw cut um, results, and you do for the most part see a difference between the fiber, which is mix one, mix number one. By the way, is is uh, non-fiber reinforced. Mix two is, is fiber reinforced. So you can see pretty much everywhere uh, you do have the difference you'd expect where the, the fiber reinforced concrete is higher. Um, I think there is one case where it actually switched. Yeah, it's uh, for the uh, the sod samples, for whatever reason, the fiber reinforced uh, flexural strengths were actually a little less than, actually quite a bit less for the 180 to 80 day results. So now for the uh, RCP testing, um, the fibers, well, this this would reflect more poorly on the fiber reinforced concrete. It did have. Uh, uh, did have have uh, higher coulombs, so not as effective in, in resisting chlorides as, as the concrete without the fibers. And the uh, 
the results, same results were kind of borne out with the, uh, the bulk and surface resistivity testing that was performed too. In the air void system, um, without the fibers, it was lower than with the fibers, which I'm not sure I fully understand that because the fibers had the higher, you know, had a higher density, achieved a higher density. So you would have thought it, it could have been flip flopped. Um, but the spacing factor and, and the air content is, you know, kind of on the low side for the uh, concrete without the fibers at 4%. But the spacing factor is is under eight thousandths for both of them. So it, it would fall into, uh, you know, an acceptable range. Now here's your things that really went south though. For uh, the freeze thaw testing, not good. Uh, there was some wide variability between pairs of fiber reinforced and non-fiber reinforced concrete. If you took the average of them, still not good. It's down like below 60% uh, the relative dynamic modulus at, uh, at 220 cycles. Uh, these I guess they didn't, weren't even able to go, I don't know if they weren't able to go to 300 cycles or if when uh, the university gave us those results, this was just what they were up to at that point, I'm not sure. But you can tell things wouldn't have been good at 300 cycles if they had gone that far. Uh, so so not, not good durability and fibers versus non-fibers wasn't really an issue here either. They're, they're both doing similarly poor And then a scaling resistance um, is acceptable. Uh, they did pass the acceptable range at, uh, at 50 cycles, so it was okay there. There's some other test results, but I don't think there were anything that was significant at this point. Um, they were measuring curling and warping, and the only thing they could really uh, say with any term determination was that the uh, the longer slabs are curling more than the than the uh, the shorter ones which stands to reason again that's that wouldn't be found surprising and that's about it so any questions i just had a comment that i want to point out to our MWRA members that this is kind of an example of something that, you know, if your state has a section and is interested in instrumenting it, we, you know, we have done this as kind of a, a trial project. It, it was a little bumpy trying to deal with contractor schedules and scheduling <laughs> when our people come down. But anyway, it, it, it was, it's, it's an interesting uh, exercise and the ability for us to provide expertise if, if you're interested in, you know, creating a test section somewhere in your state. Yeah, I don't think we would have done it ourselves. So, <laughs> and I think we got we got bit by the virus and the fact that they were just about to do load testing this spring, and then everything got canceled. So, um, there will be more data coming out of this project. Yeah, John, this is Mike Radler from Dow. Hey, Mike. Um, one thing for your edification is to go back and look at your mix design and understand what your paste fraction was compared to your, your aggregate sand solid, vo solid volume fraction. I know Jeff Raisler has been doing a lot in there looking at what that volume fraction of paste in the initial mix does to both the compactability as well as the, the properties. Um, and I mean, I'll be honest, I, I did a project that used that same admixture with some guys down in Alabama and the, the strengths that were achieved on this project don't wow me. <laughs> They're about half of what we were able to do with a similar power 45 curve gradation, fairly standard mix design. I mean, a you know, 91 day strength was almost 7,000. So it just, you know, but again, I part of the challenge in that project was trying something new with a contractor who'd never really done much work in that space before. And so, you know, even when Richard Mafuko from Andale kind of pitched in to help them out in the fall, 
I mean, they'd already run into a mess of problems, and so this is this confounding between new material, new process, you know, and, and what, what caused some of the challenges. Yeah, and also, too, it's a challenge, you know, using the local aggregates in that area to try to come up with uh, the right optimized mix. Okay. Your, your fiber results I found interesting, too, um, in the sense that, you know, my own experience with polymer macrofibers is no matter how much you put surface coatings on them um, that are not bound to the polypropylene, you always end up with a low density zone right around the fiber, which is kind of consistent with your conductivity data. And I know Jeff Jeff also had a bunch of pictures from one of his PhD students that you could actually see the low density zones around the macrofibers using like an X-ray, you know, transmission imaging system. So those are always a challenge in, in trying to throw fibers into things when you're looking for density. That was the explanation that the university gave too. I didn't put it on the presentation. Um, because I didn't really know how to explain that myself if I put it on there, but they did talk about the uh, um, the interfacial surface. Yeah. Fibers. Yeah. I mean, you're sticking a piece of very hydrophobic plastic in an aqueous environment. It doesn't like the water. <laughs> the water doesn't like it. So. Okay. Yeah. No, that makes sense. But no, interesting project. So why did they diamond grind off after they'd gone to all that trouble to power trowel? Was the, uh, we just figured it wasn't going to be. We, they assumed going into it that it wasn't going to be good enough. You know, I mean, I, I really think they, they wound up doing a better job than they probably originally conceived that they could have done. Okay. Um, but, you know, they were committed to, to grinding it, so they, they went ahead. Oh. <laughs> it was in the contract, so they fulfilled it, huh? They, they own a diamond grinder. They own their own uh, equipment, so it's not, okay. not a big deal for them to mobilize it. No, but that's one of the critical research questions around compacted concrete pavement is, you know, if you look at the as-paved surface, it's really rough. I mean, you can see in some of your pictures too, right? I mean, it it's rough. And then the fact that they went back and troweled it and smoothed it out and filled it in and probably densified it quite a bit, is this question of surface durability and rideability, you know, after that process. I mean, I, the Endale guys came up with it, and so, you know, they probably know best, but it just seems like from a research standpoint, if we had a, a panel of as compacted concrete versus a panel that had, you know, that surface filled in, um, you know, how would you see that from a, an erosion standpoint because yeah, you know I, I was with the guys from the RCC council when we went and walked some of the 35 or 40 year old military base pavements and it sure looks like they just rough in with time through natural erosion from rain and so you know having it having it smoothed out and filled in I would just wonder whether it helps cut down on some of that erosive behavior. Yeah, well, at least we're left with three panels per test section to compare with the rest of the project, so. Yeah, yeah. And Tom, I tried. They just, uh, at least we got some panels. They were supposed not to grind any of it, so imagine my shock when I went down there <laughs> the week before John's. Like, oh, no. <laughs> doesn't surprise me, but I guess we got three. We got three panels. <laughs> three panels and three in the both lanes, so it's oh. so so we got six yeah, panels, six. three yeah. side by side. So <laughs> we was, we kind of have a study within the study. We'll actually see with the power trial and with the acid with the acid blue versus okay grinding not grinding. So we're going to see how the surface wears. Yeah, we'll be, we'll be curious. Sure. Wish we had more time, but we got one speaker left to go. And hopefully we're able to, on the early opening. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you for giving me an opportunity to present uh, the current status of of this project. And this project we will to evaluate the visible and invisible uh, uh, damage uh, caused by <clears throat> early loading, quantify the effect of low uh, <clears throat> early loading. I have a talking about really early early loading on long-term performance. And finally, 
uh, the German recommendations for uh, minimum strength uh, <coughs> at, at which the payment can be, be open to, to, to traffic and the strategy for minimizing is in, 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 and avoiding generally loading damage. Well, um, well, of course, I don't need to explain what the benefits of this project. So if we, if we can open earlier, then uh, reduce construction, time and cost, improve user satisfaction, and it, it, but on the other hand, if it's done correctly, then it will not, it, it will not increase um, the chances of premature failure. And just uh, uh, just a quick overview: the, the current strength criteria are very conservative. That was uh, I, I, um, was currently on the book at, at MinDAT. So basically, if a slab is uh, uh, thinner than seven inches, then it requires flexural strength 500 psi or compressive strength uh, uh, 3000 psi. So the, uh, and I know that MinDAT is revising these recommendations, uh, as, but, <clears throat> but, but it, it, it's, it's definitely clear that this, uh, <clears throat> this recommendation is conservative, although they might be one of the most progressive in the country. So now the ACPA um, recommended um, th this table for um, uh, street and volume uh, <coughs> for streets and low volume um, roads, and basically it says that if the uh, pavement is thicker than eight inches, then uh, for low, uh, low volume tra uh, traffic, like for let's say 100 easels, so the uh, flexural strength can be like uh, <coughs> from 370 psi to 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 go down to 300 psi, but still we're talking about only thick payments here. And as you know that in, at Min Road, they were constructed several uh, sections. There's um, uh, standard slab size, standard mix, uh, dull joints, uh, and, and they were loaded. And they were loaded at very low edge. Uh, the first, uh, the one section was loaded like by by pickup truck running in transverse direction, and it left kind of a rut, but it's important that it did not, the section did not crack, it just rutted in, um, uh, under the load. And after that, uh, um, after three, three to 11 hours after, after paving, uh, four sections were loaded, like uh, first section one, uh, 24 was was loaded, and, and the truck moved back and forward, and after that, 124 and 224, and eventually all four sections were loaded. And at that time, the, uh, both tensile and compressive strengths were very low. So if um, the f one, section 124 was loaded when um, the estimate of a tensile and compressive strength was less than 90 psi. Actually, 90 psi happened only when the section was loaded the second time, and um, and even like the last section was when it was loaded, flexural strength was 300 uh, psi, and that caused me a, mm, a lot of grief because up until very very recently, I'm talking about recently, like in the last last couple of weeks. I could not explain why uh, section 124 did not fail from the first load application. And mm, that bothered me a lot and uh, uh, kind of slowed down uh, development of further procedures, although, although we did make some progress. But because the reason if you can't explain why the section did not fail, then it's difficult to uh, to develop like rational recommendations after that, but on the other hand, in, in, intuitively, you feel that this concrete should not be open to traffic at this low strength. But how to explain why this failure didn't occur? Okay, so um, uh, just a little bit on strength development. The, the, the pavement was paved in the in the warm day, so actually concrete in the um, field. 
uh, hardening faster than hardened in the lab, and the maturity, uh, what this maturity curve uh, suggests. So basically, basically we can estimate uh, strength at, at, at every, every loading, and, and, and this 460, uh, 460 5 PSI strength was achieved in less than one day, but still, this strength was achieved after all the cells were loaded. So, it was, but before they will load it after that. Also, there is a typo here, is a, um, and, and this strength is 2400 PSI, I believe, at 500 PSI tensile strength after two days. Yes, it's, it's sorry, it's a typo here. Now, and we analyzed uh, the data collected by um, mineral uh, engineers, and and I saw uh, you saw the um, the slides before, so I go really quickly over them. It's just a brief summary: of what we've done, we analyze and reanalyze dynamic strain gauge data, and we uh, like we used the results of peak peak analysis provided by. Um, mean that to us, and we compared st uh, strains at f for various testing dates, and we didn't find any any negative effect of um, early loading, like section 424 that was loaded last and loaded, uh, and country was relatively st uh, strong, exhibited, the, exhibit the if anything, just higher um, um, strains than section 124 and section 224 that were loaded before that. And uh, up to, for now, we analyze uh, strain gauges up to, uh, I believe, 2018 data, and I believe the uh, most, of this, most of the cells uh, uh, don't produce reliable data after that. But there is, the bottom line is we could not find any evidence of damage from um, those strain gauges. We analyzed vibration wire data from construction. Again, we couldn't see it's uh, well, vibration wire is used to, to measure um, temperature, but basically behavior of all cells was like, um, uh, very similar. So we, we didn't see any negative effects of, of vibration wire. So now we, uh, we analyzed the ultrasound the tomography data, it, uh, I mean that, and I hope that we'll get more data it, uh, soon, because that's that's the only piece of information I, I do want to to get hold on, then just to confirm uh, <coughs> our hypothesis we'll, we'll talk about later. But the initial data did not reveal any damage from ultrasound tomography. This, it confirmed that strengths developed very quickly, it's, uh, uh, there was some small indication of uh, surface damage, but first of all, it was not very pronounced. And second, we need to confirm that uh, it's, uh, sorry, there's no confidence that our analysis tool that was developed for all the concrete is, apl uh, is applicable for <laughs> testing concrete at, um, <clears throat> at early age. So if, if we get, uh, uh, new data later now, then we should be able to uh, in, um, to evaluate if um, uh, if there is any surface damage which caused by um, uh, the, the solar loading. I, I uh, personally I think that we will, uh, there is no damage, but again, that still uh, remains to be, <coughs> remains to be checked. So we performed the calculation analysis. And we used deflection from uh, central loading and edge loading. Again, the results were more or less uh, more or less normal. There was nothing really really unusual. I definitely, not, we didn't see any effect of um, early loading. The only our observation was that the load transfer efficiency of joints was a little bit low than I would expect for relatively new, well, actually quite new. Uh, doubt payment, but well, but but, but the, there was no correlation between performance of a control cell and uh, uh, cells uh, <coughs> loaded earlier. Uh, this slide shows initial roughness 
um, and you can see that actually the write quality is pretty good for all the loaded sections. Of course, the uh, cell 624 that has a, has a rat, it shows poor write quality than expected. Uh, the sec section 524 is actually a control section, but it's located next to 624 and it's a very short section. So it's possible that um, high IRI is caused by some um, kind of spillover effect from a poor item of 624. Uh, there might be some other explanation just because IRI calculation for very short section um, is not very reliable. But the bottom line is uh, the initial ride was was pretty good for all the sections and there is no de deterioration of ride <clears throat> over time. So, so, so that brings us to the first question, uh, first but very important question. Why uh, we did not see any, any damage in the uh, cost by early loading and here we just would like to, to play a video how the sections were loaded and the most important um, well there are two important observations number one the loading was uh, at, at some appreciable distance from the, the slab edge and that's important because in our uh, initial simulation for place the load closer to the edge that would like more like more normal will pass position and that increased um, um, our stresses but but still so so um, after we, we we repeated this analysis so again we built a ice slab model and we run a factorial and uh, present a few results so basically we um, model concrete with various young's modulus so and one million psi to model like stiffness at the just all, shortly after concrete set like three hours after concrete set and four million psi uh, like for the last loading of cell uh, 424 um, um, because our estimate that on on the next day the young's modulus was a, um, about 5.2 million psi so in this case this estimate should be reasonable we we use aggregate base we assume unbounded interface for the base that's what typically done and young's modulus of the, of the base lays 4000 psi and we, mo we model tandem loading to 22 tip and what we in the, in the past we try to use a standard modeling procedure and we always apply some level of curling but uh, when we evaluated our data, we decided that since the payment was performed on a warm day and, uh, and the loads were applied sh uh, shortly after concrete set, it's quite likely that uh, temp um, concrete temperature was still elevated. There was some even micro press stress in the, in the payment. Um, so temperature hasn't started dropping yet. And, um, and um, so basically at this stage, we should ignore uh, uh, the effect of curling and because actually we, we couldn't really, really estimate what it is but in our estimate it's pretty close to flat slab condition so <clears throat> with even with this analysis we uh, we got uh, so there are three cases and we can see that um, when Young's modulus was um, 2 million psi so basically it corresponds to uh, third and fourth passes then uh, stress were 125 and 140 psi and they, they're sig significantly lower than 200 psi in theory they might provide watch this case might provide some damage but it just it's difficult to detect from one load repetition but the problem was with the first case cell 124 because we see the stress is 113 psi a strength is actually lower than 90 psi. So, what uh, um, so we uh, tried different approaches to explain it, 
And one of the idea was that uh, the effect of uh, the, the effect of friction with the base layer was ignored in our analysis. And and for conventional analysis, that analysis, it's a, a kind of reasonable assumption because. Uh, uh, the, the, when the concrete is very stiff, and, and especially if, if, if a slab is thicker, then the traction contribution of the uh, of the base layer can be ignored. But this is not an unusual case. In this case, we might at least consider the, the, the effect of full bond for the base layer. And another important uh, another important point here that when we say damage, we usually we compare. Uh, stresses with the, with the modulus of rupture, which is a beam strength, and that might not be necessarily correct in this case. So first, what we've done, we, we uh, rerun the program assuming the full uh, bump condition. The stresses that are dropped to 700 or to 75 psi that are at least comparable with the flexural strength. Flexural strength was a little bit below the 90 psi, uh, but that's uh, assuming that. It, the concrete was in full bond uh, with the base, and that assumption is uh, quite unrealistic. But, but at least uh, it shows that most likely the stress was somewhere between 113 and 75 psi. But the, the next step, we uh, I looked at the PhD thesis of uh, Dr. <coughs> Rosler, who was mentioned already, oops, uh, before, um, and. In his thesis, he compared um, uh, fatigue, um, uh, fatigue performance of simply supported beam, simply support, uh, uh, fully supported beam uh, beams, and uh, sorry, and the plate beams. And he found that for the for the exa for the exactly same mix, uh, the, the fatigue life of the simply supported beams and uh, fully supported beams is very similar, but the fatigue uh, life of the plates because of uh, large area and, and different type of behavior is actually significantly higher, especially for low load repetitions. It's about um, the, uh, it had similar performance for, well, well so the, the ratio in, in performance is about like 30%. So basically you, the, a plate can survive 30% higher stresses than the modulus of rupture test. Change in temperature was not significant. So if it's a, uh, later on, there were significantly, it could be much higher variations in temperature and that could affect um, uh, development.
and basically it allows to to uh, to place uh, like, like residential traffic up to uh, yeah. 10 uh, 10 keep total vehicle weight yeah, immediately after joint saw cutting and I and I do see it as very reasonable and the second after for and the second is more concerned with uh, um, <clears throat> early age repair so it allows two, 2000 uh, psi or three uh, three, uh, three, 2000 psi compression strength or 300 psi flexural strength. Just a comment here. Yeah. This is this is Bernard. Um, we have some new data for the PI, and uh, we'll be sharing them within the next two days. We have some new mirror data. We swept mm -hmm. the cells 124 to 624. We also swept some of the repair cells. Uh, the one particularly with the roller compacted concrete, as well as the Internal cure, internally cured uh, mix. Uh, so we have some mirror data that we'll be sharing with the PI shortly. Okay, we took great. them within the last three weeks. <laughs> All right. Thank you. He's asking for a lot of feedback. <laughs> Any other questions? I know if nothing else, just listening to it, I know occasionally I've been asked to come and look at payments that have uh, had the inadvertent driver that couldn't pay attention to the signs going to cut over something and it's always been what do you do with it you know, it's, you know it's just lightly over and it's not rather too bad where you can live with the ride you know especially if it's a car or a small vehicle maybe it is okay if you can live with that slight bump um, so well if there are no questions I'd like to thank Joe John and Lev for taking the time out to give the presentations and, uh, and sharing out uh, what's uh, some of the research that's going on with the group. And uh, I know we're over time. We had a, a kind of a shaky start with the technology, but we eventually figured it out. Uh, unless somebody's got some other information, I think the next meeting, if I looked on the calendar right, I think it's July 1st. And uh, hopefully by then, maybe we may have some feedback on the call for innovations of the second round and see what maybe an opportunity to talk about uh, what's coming out of that and with that tom unless you can think of something else for the group and, and these will be posted like the other ones correct yep yeah these are this is recorded too so all right well, with that, unless time you got some, I think we're adjourned. I appreciate everybody uh, attending. Again, thanks to the speakers. And uh, be looking for the emails for the uh, other presentations, webinars on about June 24th. So enjoy the rest of your day. Yep, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> thank you.